And before we get started, anyone want to get out? Hi, it's me again. Feels like a minute since we've been here, mostly because I was out of commission with heat-related illness last week and I'm still not feeling quite myself. So, hi, welcome back. You might notice some changes. For one thing, the webcam. Yeah, so we've got some new webcam action here and I'm not quite sure how I like it. I don't think anybody really needs to see me in 4K, but here we are. The delay seems to be weird. So on the other hand, you can probably read all the titles on the bookshelves behind me. And you might also notice some little little open spots over there. I went through my TBR on those two shelves and pulled out things that I had already read to be reshelved and took them down to the, the downstairs library or put them in the upstairs library, as the case may be. More than you wanted to know. I'm sure. So we are here for a 15 minute session. Let me start my timer. Oh, you guys have questions. You guys have lots of questions. So the first comes from reader NS. Um, nice to see you. I recognize your username. And they're asking about steel floor. Pointed at the webcam, Lily. Okay. So the question was, can you talk a little bit about the influences on steel flower? Oh, can I? <laughs> Boy, howdy, can I? Uh, I've been thinking about this lately because I'm working on the Highlands War, which has reached a point, you know, about 40,000 words in, where I'm like, oh God, what have I, what have I done? <laughs> so... Yeah, we're about 40,000 words in, and I'm like, I feel like the story's not going anywhere, but the muse and Kai are both like, no, you need this in order to understand what happens later. So some of the scenes that my subscribers are getting now will probably be cut in the finished work, and some of the stuff is going to be elided or you know, collapsed into one big scene instead of two or three mini ones, and you know, it's messy. Creation is always messy, but we're talking about influences on, on Steel Flower. Well, Conan the Barbarian, big, big influence. More movie Conan than, than book Conan, if I'm to be absolutely honest. I wondered what Conan might be like, perhaps, filtered through female experience. Um, when, you know, Kaya is not... She's not a Conan figure, but she's very heavily influenced by that, that sword and sorcery, that idea that you're a sword for hire, you're to the highest bidder, you have your own sense of honor. So that was a huge influence. A C.L. Moore, Jirel Ojoari, which I actually came across first in a Filk song. Jirel uh, Ojoari, no man is her master and well she protects us, we know. I, sh I should dig that up again and listen to it. Um, so that was a huge influence, more the song than the stories, although the stories are great. So if you if you ever get a chance to pick up the Jurel of Jouari stories, they are A+. Another huge influence that I haven't talked about a lot is Joe Clayton's Drinker of Souls trilogy, where there's Bran, the, the Drinker of Souls. I think, I think it's Bran. Anyway, Bran starts out the trilogy as a young girl growing up in Arthslaya, which is like an artist collective. It's a very different culture than the one she comes into contact with later. And something happens. Her home gets swept up in this kind of war between gods. And one of the things that Joe Clayton does really well in that, that trilogy, which I should do a reading with Lily uh, on some of the Joe Clayton books because they are just fabulous. One of the things Clayton does really well is the sort of the anthropomorphizations of of gods. There's there's Tunji, the luck god, who's a, a hermaphrodite, and uh, their pronouns, hisser and himmer, sheesh and heesh. 
So the, the pronouns are great. And this was stuff that was published way back in the 80s. So Joe Clayton, um, especially Kaya's love of the sea and her, her sailing, that comes directly from that series, that whole trilogy. Kaya's relationships with, with like pirate captains and other sailors come directly from that. And a lot of the, the Mai, her, her own homeland, comes from some of the, the cultures in there. Um, the sorcerer Maxime in that trilogy actually has been kicking around in my head for a long time and I, I haven't brought him into Kaya's world but he's I think going to show up in the innkeeper's war which is what I'm building next so I'm always thinking a few books ahead when I finish the Blacklands Bane trilogy which I'm currently working on as well uh, I plan to go into the innkeeper's war and we'll, we'll see if any trad publisher wants any of that so those are some of the major influences on, on Kaya, as well as music. And just, I wanted a female mercenary, a sword and sorcery mercenary who wasn't a lady in distress. Um, Red Sonia, Brigitte Nielsen in Red Sonia is, is a huge influence on, on Kaya. But if I had to pick the biggest influence on Steel Flower, it would be Joe Clayton's Drinker of Souls series. So now you know. And, and yes, eventually I'll do a, a reading with Lily on that, I think. I think the upcoming reading with Lily will be The Great Gatsby, because we were talking about The Great Gatsby online earlier. But that's another story. So the next question is from reader A.T., and there was also reader K.A. who um, asked me, you know, remind me um, in the Valentine series about Danny's psychopomp. Was, was it Anubis? And so um, K.A. is one of my beta readers. So hi. Um, and this, this other reader had written in and asking about why Danny needs a psychopomp and why Anubis. Because Anubis, the jackal-headed god of the dead, is... Danny Valentine's psychopomp. Now, a psychopomp is a figure, may or may not be a god, but it is a, a figure that helps a soul, human soul, through the transition into death. Um, a psychopomp kind of picks you up and takes you over the border. You are, you don't die alone. You are greeted at the door by this this figure, and naturally, when you're working with that kind of thing, you need some psychological insurance. Danny talks about it in the Valentine books, the ins and outs of psychopomps, which was interesting for me because all through the Valentine series I was taking dictation from her, as you can no doubt tell. So she said that necromancers are kind of unique among scions because they have this connection to the psychopomp and Danny doesn't know whether it's, you know, gods are actual beings or if they're just psychological crutches, um, appurtenances, appliances to get us there. I don't really think it matters. Of course, I, I deal with gods and godlike beings and disembodied intelligences that, that may or may not have human morals and ethics in, in my work. And actually, last week I was interviewed by... Rick Kleffel and uh, Dr. Lori Clinchard, I think, about AI. And we were talking about AI and gods and similarities and how human beings deal with these these things. If artificial intelligence was a thing. Anyway, <laughs> chat saying hello. Hello. So the deeper question here is why Anubis? The simple answer is, I don't know. Danny came out of the box that way. The instant she started talking behind my left ear, she had this relationship with this, this god, a patron. Now, I was familiar with the idea of having patrons and working with patrons as an occultist or, or a witch or a sorcerer. It, all very different things, mind you. So I was used to this idea of patrons, but she took it in a very different direction. And if you're like, oh, Lily, you're talking about these imaginary people as if they're real, they're very real to me. And I think that's, I think that's part of the, the grace of being a writer, 
Um, the grace of creativity, also a huge drawback because you start saying these people are very real to me and next stop might be the loony bin. And we don't want that, do we? I don't want that. So why Anubis? I don't know. He just sort of invited himself in. I was much more comfortable later in the series when Sekhmet started paying more attention to Danny, when Danny's anger needed that volcanic outlet. And I, given my druthers, I would have picked something else. But when you start taking dictation from the voice behind your left ear and writing a five book series on necromances and demons and all that, uh, some of that goes out the window. One's own preferences are not always taken into account. So I don't know. It just came from that place where fortunate accidents happen and I picked it up and ran with it. Um, learning to submit to the process was very much a lesson in the Valentine books. I mean, it had been a lesson in earlier stuff, but really what drove it home with the Valentine books. And so we come to the last question of the day, which is from Reader QR, excellent username, by the way. And uh, why do I just use the initials uh, for privacy? If I don't know, or if you haven't given me explicit permission to use your name, I'm just gonna use initials. So when you write in to me, the most it's gonna happen is initials. And if you don't write in with your, your name, then I just take initials from your username where it, it seems to be appropriate. So that's how that happens. And actually, Ruta QR, uh, this is kind of a misnomer because I'm getting two or three questions a week about Hell's Acre. When, when will Hell's Acre be out? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I say I don't know a lot during these streams. But it's true, I don't know. Where Hell's Acre is right now is it's resting with a, an editor who may not have time to read it, but due to the vagaries of publishing, I can't pull it back and just say, you know, I'm tired of waiting. I'm, I'm going to just self-publish this. I cannot do that. And uh, my agent is behind me right now and visibly going, that's right, you can't. So I wanted to see if a serial written this way could make it through a trad or indie publishing process. Uh, the short answer is I don't think I'll do this again. The longer answer is I'm committed now, so I at least have to wait for that to finish out before before I have to do anything again. Now, when Hell's Acre does come out, it will be in a slightly different form than even the subscribers saw it. It will have gone through more editing, more revision, more copy edits, whatever. So it may kind of be a different book. Um, originally, Hell's Acre was supposed to be a trilogy, but writing it during the pandemic kind of put paid to some of that. Originally, uh, Avery was supposed to leave at the end of the first book. He was supposed to board ship and, and go up to Edinburgh or that world's variation of Edinburgh to meet with Morton. Uh, he That was part of the plan from the beginning. And when he returned, he would be coming back to basically a city that thought he was dead. Now, in his absence, I had planned several things sort of knock-on effects from where the first book ended and one of those would have been Gemma actually taking control of the Rooks and attempting to run it in a sort of democratic fashion uh, which was would not work <laughs> it absolutely would not work due to the personalities involved and she would have learned a number of very valuable lessons so I had that planned I had a whole second book planned figuring out going in parallel between between Avery on the one hand in Edinburgh and then his journey back and him discovering that, yeah, yeah, you can fake your own death and leave, but when you do show up at your own funeral, you know, there are consequences for doing that, not least with the, the girl you really like punching you in the face and saying, the hell out of my sight. So that was planned, and then the third book was planned to go differently. Now, in the execution, it did not happen that way. In that, in the execution, it turned into a duology. It turned into two books. The scope narrowed immensely because there, there were 
there was going to be a lot of going back and forth across the channel originally. So maybe I should, maybe I should do something, send out to subscribers a list of just things that were supposed to happen and they didn't. But it just got to a point in the pandemic where I was tired, <laughs> the subscribers were tired. Um, it's not that they were tired of the story, it's just it had been going on for a while and I think we were all ready for something new. And I had always, I had not always planned to do Highlands War after Hell's Acre, but things were sort of gelling at a rapid pace and one of the decisions that I made partway through the pandemic was if I do end up catching the plague, I want it to be after this thing is done. So I, I moved some things around, shuffled some things back and forth. And at that point, the decision to have Highlands War be the next serial really came into focus. I had the, the cover from Skyla for months before I could show it to you guys. The, the subscribers are, will remember that I was like, I have something great. For the next serial but I can't show you guys yet I can't show you guys yet for months I was doing this we got off topic we're talking about Hell's Acre so I don't know the publisher might come back and say we like this but it needs more and in that case I might say well how does turning it into a trilogy and me writing an interstitial book and then basically scrapping a lot of, of book three, but also weaving in a lot of those ends into the new shape in book three sound. So that might be something that happens, but the publisher needs to get their ducks in a row, which will not happen soon. Publishing, especially right now, is all about delayed gratification. There are so many moving parts, and right now, in trad publishing especially, because Hells Acre is now sitting with a trad publisher, waiting for a determination. It's already got a determination from, I think, two other imprints, and now it's sitting with a third, where I kind of wanted it to go in the first place, but I don't think it will end up there. This is part of the, the working stuff behind the curtain of a writer's career. So... Right now, it's sitting with that third publisher, and in trad publishing right now, you have this contraction where there's only four or five big publishers. There's a whole lot of imprints, but the imprints are just tiny little companies under the umbrella, and the thing that happens when you only have four or five massive publishers is they start getting rid of what they view as extraneous jobs, extraneous people. And that means that everything takes longer because everybody's overworked and the people who are making things go smoothly have been tossed out because they were making too much and somebody came through and decided to cut the tall poppies as the, as the saying goes. So I knew it would take a while in trad. Um, would I do this again with a cereal? No. But... Fortunately, Steel Flower is a self-published thing that, well, fortunately, I could go on a rant about that, but my timer has already gone off, so we're, we're coming to the end of the Q&A for today. So, Hell's Acre, as soon as I know, you guys will know. If I do get a back, a sorry, we're not interested from this particular publisher, which I think I will, it will probably go into the self-publish queue. If it doesn't, uh, there is a an indie publisher who is very interested, and, and it might go there. So what you don't see as a reader is behind the screen all these moving parts coming around and the writer going, I can't tell you yet, I can't tell you yet, because nothing has been set in stone, no contract has been signed, everybody's out on vacation, some people are back from vacation, but they've been moved to a different job, or moved to a different department, so it's all a mess right now, frankly. Publishing, tried publishing, is, is a giant mess right now, so that has knock-on effects, I feel like I've been saying that a lot this stream, for readers, and also for the writers, since we are the face and the names on the books, the, the readers get angry with us over things that are that, that could not be more out of our control. So, you know, when will Hell's Acre come out? 
damned if I know <laughs> at this point. I have several plans. We'll see which one of those plans ends up coming to fruition. It will come out the moment I know you, my beloveds, will as well. So that brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Remember, you can drop questions into the YouTube comments. You can send them through the, uh, the feedback form on my website. You can ask them on social media. I might not respond, but I do read everything that comes in, sometimes to my detriment. So please try to be courteous. There have been a tranche of not so courteous, courteous questions about uh, why I make certain choices. How about I'll, I'll throw this bonus answer out there. The bonus answer is because I want to. I wear what I want. I write what I want. I stream how I want. I say what I want on my own bloody website. If that bothers you, I'm not the writer for you. We can each go with our little gods and you know, I might switch the webcam back because I'm not sure this 4K is doing it for either of us. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this short Q&A stream. I hope you've had a lovely time. Um, send in your questions. Again, if I get a lot of questions, I might collate them down into one. If there's a particularly interesting one, I'll bring it up in the next stream. I've got like 80 questions, so we're not going to run out anytime soon. So I've got like 80 questions on the list. So thank you. And I will try to keep up. <sighs> Have a lovely Tuesday. I get to go back to work riding Gamble and the Highlands War. And maybe drinking a bit more coffee. I feel like I should go out and do another pot of coffee. We'll see what happens. Thanks for being here. I hope you have a lovely day. And I will see you later in the week. Ta-ta. <laughs>